Today, the 24th of August, 2024, is the third year um, we are celebrating Ukrainian Independence Day um, during a full-scale war with uh, Russia. Um, we have turned the corner completely from a situation where uh, Russia was supposed to, or thought it would, conquer Ukraine in three days to Ukraine conquering Kursk in three days. We've also gone from a situation where the Russians were absolutely convinced their army was the second best in the world to a situation today where their army is the second best in Russia. A good way to try to understand what is taking place, I believe, is to think of this as what everybody believed would have happened back in 1991. Then most people thought the USSR would disintegrate along the lines of Yugoslavia. There would be conflicts over borders and, and warfare. There was a little bit of that in a few countries like Moldova, Georgia, especially Azerbaijan, Armenia. But on the whole, the USSR disintegrated very peacefully, very quietly. There were very strong indications right at the beginning that uh, even people amongst uh, Boris Yeltsin's so-called democratic team, um, that they harbored territorial pretensions towards uh, Ukraine. And at the time of the disintegration of the USSR in 1990, um, Alexander Zolzhenitsyn, the exiled Russian nationalist dissident, actually published um, a quite a big pamphlet called How to Rebuild Russia, where he called for the USSR to be replaced by a Russian union of Russians, Ukrainians and Belarusians. He, he also included northern, northern Kazakhstan, but let's forget that for the time being. Um, the most important thing is that this project of his um, back in 1990-91 was, was largely ignored, um, but Putin, of course, returned to this. Um, in the 2000s, when Putin was Russian president, he became very close friends with Zolzhenitsyn and began implementing Zolzhenitsyn's program for a Russian Union or a Russian world um, of the three Eastern Slavs from about 2007 onwards. So Zolzhenitsyn had the final say in that sense um, in, in influencing very much uh, the, the imperial nationalism of, um, of Vladimir Putin, particularly over questions such as Ukrainians are just a really a branch of the Russian people, uh, little Russians, and also that southeastern Ukraine is, was wrongly included uh, inside, um, the, inside Soviet Ukraine in the 1920s when the USSR was created, and that this is historically Russian land. Of course, as we know from the question of the borders everywhere, this is a ridiculous type of approach, the idea of using what are so-called historical um, territories, um, because once you open this Pandora's box, you have a multitude of countries making territorial demands. How about the Kuril Islands then, going back to Japan, or Karelia going back to Finland, or Prussia, so-called Kaliningrad going back to Germany, and so on and so on and so on. So if, if it's okay for Russia to bring up historical uh, so-called territories, then why not other countries? And by the way, this has implications for Kursk. Some Ukrainian soldiers have had quite a good, quite a funny time um, changing Russian signs for Ukrainian and saying Kursk now it belongs to Sumy Oblast in Ukraine. In the 1920s, all of these border regions, Belv, Bilhorod, Kursk, Bryansk, and of course Kuban in the Northern Caucasus were all Ukrainian speaking. Many Russian, sol many Ukrainian soldiers have actually met Ukrainian speaking locals in Kursk. Um, so if we are going to um, talk about historical territories, then why not Ukraine include these territories inside Ukraine? What's good for Russia is good for other countries as well. But I think 
going back to the question that what is taking place since 2022, to some degree 2014, but especially 2022, um, is what everybody thought would happen in 1991. It did not then. Then we had um, a not very sober Boris Yeltsin most of the time. So, of course, he couldn't really command an army. He was pretty much drunk often. And um, you, he would be he would go AWOL for weeks on end because he'd probably been on a binge or some somewhere. A bit like Dmitry Medvedev today, he's, he has the same alcoholic problem. Um, so the Ukraine and Russia peacefully divorced. Kravchuk, then the Ukrainian president, described uh, the CIS, the Commonwealth of Independent States, which was created um, to replace the USSR, minus the three Baltic states. Uh, Krauchuk called the CIS um, a civilized divorce. And um, this didn't mean there weren't problems, quarrels, disputes, conflicts throughout the period from the 1990s. Russia began laying claim to Sevastopol and Crimea as early as May 1992. So this is not something new that Putin brought up. And I think it's wrong for some scholars and, and writers, including books I've recently read um, that somehow want to make a clear dividing line between the Boris Yeltsin era and the Vladimir Putin era. That's not the case. There was a lot of overlap between the two. Many of the so-called frozen conflicts in places like Georgia, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Moldova, were happened under Yeltsin, not under Putin. Um, and um, it took the whole decade of the 1990s for Russia to finally sign a treaty recognizing Ukraine's borders. In fact, it wasn't ratified by the upper house of the Russian parliament till 1999. So at the end of Lenin Kuchma's first term in office. Um, and therefore, it was difficult to deal with, um, with Russia throughout this period of time. What I think you can differentiate is that Yeltsin didn't use military force, he used maybe economic pressure, energy pressure, but Putin was the one that reverted to military force. A good, a good manner in which to understand why this has happened is to look at the roots of Russia's uh, full-scale invasion in 2022 compared to the military aggression and annexation of Crimea in 2014. And I think it can be broken down into four small, uh, four important areas. I'll, I won't go into them in very much detail, but they certainly are um, a reversal to pre-Soviet kind of Tsarist, white Russian emigre, imperial nationalism. Um, ironically, and I'm saying this is an anti-communist, um, the Soviet Union looks far better than what we have in Putin's Russia today. In the Soviet Union, Ukrainians were recognized as a separate people by the Soviet regime. The Ukraine language was recognized as a separate language. Of course, it was Russification. Ukraine was a founding member of the United Nations in 1946. The Stalin managed to wrangle three seats at the UN for the USSR representing Russia and Ukraine and Belarus. Um, Compared to, to, to now, where Putin's regime says there are no Ukrainian people, Ukraine is a fictitious state, and Ukrainians are just a little Russian branch of a pan-Russian people together with great Russians and white Russians. Ukraine language is just a weird dialect. It's not a real language. So we've actually gone backwards, even compared to the Soviet period. You also, I think another, another route, a second route would be the tremendous uh, fanning of Soviet nostalgia in, in uh, Putin's Russia. The, one of the major differences between Ukraine and Russia is that in Ukraine, there's no longer really wide support for nostalgia for reviving the USSR. Something like less than 5% of Ukrainians want or have a harboring for, for nostalgia for the Soviet Union. That's not the case in in Russia, where Putin has promoted this nostalgia and very much linked the Soviet regime, the Soviet Union, 
to Russia as an imperial identity and power. Um, and playing on that is, of course, the whole question of uh, the fanning of the so-called Great Patriotic War, uh, the war between 1941-45, not 39 to 45, and linked to that, um, the idea that it was really just Russia that won that war, Ukrainians were important, ignoring the fact that six million people died in Ukraine. And Ukrainians were the ones who liberated, for example, Berlin. The famous photograph of a Soviet soldier putting a flag on the German Reichstag is actually a Ukrainian from Kharkiv. Thirdly, a xenophobia. Um, we've had a massive growth in the last 20 years of anti-Western xenophobia, which is linked to the Ukrainian question in Russian eyes. For Russian imperial nationalists, whether it was in the late 19th century or today, uh, Ukraine is, a, is an artificial construct promoted by Western anti-Russian powers. It used to be the Poles, the Austrians, and, and now it's the Americans and the European Union promoting that. So that anti-xenophobia anti anti is very much linked to anti-Ukrainism. Uh, in the eyes of the Kremlin, they are fighting the West in Ukraine. Finally, divergence. Um, the, the breakup in 1991 was peaceful, but Ukraine and Russia went on completely different paths. They began in, with very different starting points. Uh, Russia inherited all of the Soviet Union institutions in Moscow. Um, so the former Soviet KGB, military, foreign affairs, internal affairs were all taken over by Russia. Places like Ukraine and the other republics had to build those institutions up from the bottom up. Uh, Ukraine has had maybe a faltering, but at the very least a democratic process in the last 30 years. Um, most of the elections, except for 2004, were free and fair, recognized as free and fair by Western international organizations. Um, that's not the case in Russia. Russia has been barely a democracy in the last 30 years. Um, Putin has taken Russia to authoritarianism. And now in the last three, four years, he changed the constitution to make him de facto president for life and transform Russia into a totalitarian fascist state. So Ukraine and Russia have gone on completely divergent paths. And especially after 2014, when the Euromaidan revolutionaries came to power in Ukraine and pro-Russian forces became very marginalized, um, Ukraine went on the path of becoming a truly Ukrainian state. Um, what Adrian Karatnitsky in his new book calls um, the Poroshenko creating a patriotic Ukrainian state. That's at the same time as Russia's moving more and more into a very imperial nationalist direction and denial of Ukraine and Ukrainian people. So that divergence becomes even greater after 2014 when you have Ukrainianization speeding up in Ukraine, decommunization, um, and of course the Ukraine Orthodox Church uh, receiving independence autocephaly from, from, from Russia. So that divergence grows even more. Um, for, for Russian nationalists like Putin, 2022 was the last chance in his eyes to keep Ukraine connected to Russia, tied to Russia, otherwise Ukraine would be gone forever. What are Russia's goals? Um, the reason why the war is so bitter, and many people, of course, including myself, could never have imagined a war on this kind of World War II scale could take place in Europe in the 21st century. We always believe these kind of conflicts were in other parts of the world, not in Europe. Um, well, um, the goal of, of, the, of, the, of Russia, of the Kremlin, of Vladimir Putin is very simple, it's genocide. Um, the destruction of Ukrainian identity, destruction of the Ukrainian state, transformation of what is left of the Ukrainian people into little, to sort of pliant puppet little Russians. Um, and Ukraine, what's left of it, minus the territories annexed by Russia, would become this little Russian puppet state. Ukraine would resemble Lukashenko's Belarus. It would be 
sovereign, but not really sovereign. It would be a Russian colony, a Russian puppet state. That is the goal. So the idea that some had until the Kursk incursion by Ukraine to somehow do a deal with Russia, that Russia gets to keep what is currently occupying, which is 20% of Ukraine, and then there'll be a kind of a, a peaceful settlement, is a myth, because this will never be enough for Russia. The, the, Russia currently does not occupy a single big Ukrainian city. Uh, R Russia's goals have remained from the very beginning and continue to remain, even though they are not realistic, the occupation of the big cities of Ukraine, which they regard as Russian cities. Kharkiv, Odessa, Dnipropetrovsk, Kiev. In the eyes of Russian nationalists, Russian imperialists like Putin, these are Russian cities, not Ukrainian cities. And they have to be occupied or destroyed, or one of the two. Um, so Russia would never stop at some kind of peace agreement where it only had 20% of the Ukrainian territory, which is basically the Donbass, southern Zaporizhia Oblast, and eastern Kherson Oblast. That would never be enough for Russia. It would be, in, it would be just an attempt at rebuilding the Russian army um, to then come back and try and capture the rest of Ukraine and destroy uh, free independent Ukraine and commit genocide against the Ukrainian people. Just to see what is taking place, there have been quite a few studies done of what is happening in Russian occupied southeastern Ukraine and what are the Russians doing there? Well, de Ukrainization, Russification, introducing Soviet kind of Russian history into schools, education. Uh, banning all the Ukrainian churches. Um, the only church allowed is the Russian Orthodox Church. So the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Orthodox Church of Ukraine and Protestant churches like the Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses are all banned. Um, so the idea that, oh, Ukrainians are repressing Russian Orthodox is completely false. The, the real repression of religion is taking place in Russian occupied Ukraine. Together with that, you have, of course, executions, torture, repression, uh, imprisonment um, of Ukrainian patriots. The outcome of all of this is that there is simply, and this is what opinion polls show, there is no other alternative except for Ukrainians to continue fighting. Um, because to, to do a deal with Putin, firstly, it would be never enough for his appetite, and secondly, um, he, uh, they would never stop at that. It would just be an attempt at rebuilding. Um, the idea that somehow the war would, would ground to a halt, it would kind of resemble, shall we say, North and South Korea or East and West Germany, that would never be the case. So that is unlikely. Um, and also Ukrainians don't trust, rightfully so, anything that Putin signs. It's a complete waste of time. In invading Ukraine first in 2014 and then later, Russia infringed countless documents it signed with Ukraine, including recognizing the Ukrainian border and also uh, the Budapest Memorandum of 1994, where Russia, together with Britain and America, gave Ukrainian security assurances, recognizing its territorial integrity in return for giving up nuclear weapons. So there's simply no trust in whatever Putin says. He's a serial, serial, serial liar, and we cannot trust him, and Ukrainians do not trust him. Opinion polls in Ukraine show majority uh, of Ukrainians would like to continue um, fighting. They believe in victory. This, of course, goes up and down. It went down after the failed counteroffensive last year. It's now gone back up with the Kursk incursion. But nevertheless, they don't really see an alternative to that. Um, the bigger problem isn't the Ukrainian side, the bigger problem is the Western side. Uh, Western governments um, have drip fed military aid to Ukraine um, because they want to give it only enough for Ukraine to survive and not be defeated, but never enough for Ukraine to have a victory. Um, the United States and Germany in particular um, have never said 
publicly they wish to see Russia be militarily defeated. And this, I think, is a problem. The Republicans in the US, whatever we might think of them, have a point when they complain that the Biden administration has never stated that what its goals are in supplying this military aid to Ukraine. And let's remember, a long drawn out, never ending war is bad for Ukraine. More will get destroyed, more Ukrainians will die. Ukrainians want the war to end quickly. Um, and then they can rebuild the country, people can return home. Um, and so the current Western policy will simply drag the war out. It won't end the war. Um, on top of that, you have some countries like um, some Southern European countries, and in particular, um, which is a big disappointment, Canada, um, providing very little military support to Ukraine. In this sense, the, the Trudeau government is a major disappointment um, for Ukraine. Um, but that's part and parcel of its um, lack of commitment to NATO. Uh, Canada is at the bottom five of countries um, spending money on defense in, uh, amongst the 32 NATO members. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau says that Canada will only reach the 2% of GDP spent on defense. The goal of NATO since 2006 Canada will only reach that in 2032. What happens if Donald Trump wins the elections and he's calling for an increase in spending to 3%? What will Canada do then? There is, of course, a positive side. There's a lot of negative side to this with so many Ukrainians moving abroad, social problems from the war. But the positive side is that there is simply no going back to what existed in Ukraine prior to military um, aggression by Russia. And what this means is that um, nation building in Ukraine has been speeded up, which is always the case when you have bloodshed and warfare. What would have taken place over 50 years uh, has actually taken place very quickly over a number of years. Of course, built on top of what already took place from 1991 onwards. Um, but opinion polls show in all sorts of different questions on language, history, attitudes to the past, um, identity, how you relate to other parts of Ukraine. All of those opinion polls show that the views, the biggest change in views have been amongst Eastern and Southern Ukrainians, so Russian speakers um, or formerly Russian speakers. And they, their views have moved to, to the views of those in the West. Ukrainians in Western Ukraine have not really had to change their views very much. They already had very critical views of Russia, of Russian history, of Russian imperialism, of Soviet, Soviet rule. Um, so they didn't really have to change very much. But um, Eastern and Southern Ukrainians did have to change their views. Um, and they've changed them spectacularly over questions of attitudes to the Russian past, attitudes to the Soviet past, attitudes to NATO, the European Union, and all of those views have tended to be now similar to the views you have in Western Ukraine. So what you've had in taking place is a growing sense of national integration, national cohesion. And one of the most interesting aspects of this uh, latest incursion into Kursk is that Ukrainians are showing themselves to be actually more nationally united than the Russian people are. In the last 30 years in academia, the biggest number of articles were, all, were always about how Ukraine is this terribly divided country. East versus West, Russian speakers versus Ukrainian speakers, the country is on the verge of disintegration. If, if Russia invades, there'll be so many Russian speakers supporting Russia, the place will fall apart. Well, all of that was obviously wrong, obviously wrong. Look at Russia in comparison to Ukraine. It's Russia that's the biggest mess. It's Russia where there's zero social cohesion, zero sense of civic commitment to your fellow countrymen, fellow neighbors. When Russia invaded Ukraine, there were protest movements on the streets against those Russian invaders. Ukrainian people, without any weapons, 
faced up to those Russian soldiers on the streets. They created partisan movements. They began assassinations. They began putting up leaflets. Where are the partisans? Where are the Russian partisans in Kursk Oblast? Where? <laughs> um, um, when Ukrainians fled from the Russian army, their neighbors did not begin looting their houses. In Kursk, Russian neighbors are looting their neighbors' houses um, when they have fled from, from the Ukrainian army. What kind of country is this? When it's like dog eat dog to a 10th degree. Um, and the, the, the whole Russian army is, as I've mentioned, it's the second best army in Russia. Ukraine is a far better army. This Russian army is simply just still the Soviet army where its only big advantage is the number of people it's willing to have die. Its, te it's technology, its officer corps, its training are simply incompetent, useless, in inefficient compared to that which the Ukrainians have taken on from NATO members and from Western countries. So um, the country which comes out far worse is Russia here. Um, that's partly a fact of uh, the, the stagnation of the Russian state, the Russian people under Putin. Russia has been defined by the US as a mafia state since 2010. The level of corruption is sky high, um, even compared to you know Ukraine or other countries. Um, and there simply is no civic sense of identity, consciousness, uh, fellow commitment to your other fellow Russians, as it were. Um, Russians don't feel they have any agency, any independence, any ability to influence um, or act and, 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 and do something of their own. It's, they're all passive. They are, seem to be blaming everybody except Putin for this, where it's really Putin's fault. Um, and, um, and so uh, I think I'm hoping that with the current decolonization of so-called Russian Eurasian post-Soviet studies in the West and universities, that this should be now taken on board, that Ukraine looks far better. And by the way, um, everybody talked about how Ukraine was this very divided country. Well, uh, Ukraine, the latest surveys show that about 95% of the population of Ukraine describe themselves as ethnic Ukrainian. Only 2% describe themselves as ethnic Russian. That means that Ukraine is the third largest nationally homogenous country in Europe after Poland and Portugal. So the idea that somehow Ukraine is divided is a, it was always a myth and even more so the case. The number of Russians has gone down to 2% from 22% in the 1989 Soviet census and 17% in the 2001 Ukrainian census. So Russians as an ethnic group basically no longer exist in Ukraine. Um, and with, U with Russian speakers moving over to the Ukrainian language in massive numbers, um, there will be no longer any future constituency for pro-Russian political forces, never mind political forces who are nostalgic for the Soviet Union. So as with always with war and bloodshed, there are positive and negative outcomes of this. Um, the main thing that we should be always pushing for is for Western countries to stop this drip drip approach, to give Ukraine everything it needs, to win the war as quickly as possible. That would, that would be good for the West, it would be cheaper for the West and better for the West, and it would be better for Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. Let's hope that very soon Ukraine will be celebrating its Independence Day where, together with military victory over imperialist fascist Russia. Thank you very much.